everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand. Jessup's Journal is a collection of powerful, positive, and inspirational stories. It's time for Jessup's Journal. Hi, I'm Doug Jessup. Welcome to Jessup's Journal, where we share powerful, positive, and inspirational stories. This week, we're delving into the fantasy world. Our first guest is a New York Times best-selling author of the powerful series, Fable Haven. Initial inspiration goes back to probably Narnia. When I was a okay. kid, I didn't like to read a thick book. <laughs> and, and when I finally read Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, it showed me that reading could be fun. Mm -hmm. um, the big imagination of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was really appealing to me, and, and I started living those kind of adventures in my head. I'm positive that you have not heard a dinosaur roar. Academy Award winning composer Chance Thomas just might make you think you have. What if a T-Rex stuck his head through these trees right now and roared at me? You know, and I imagined the nasty spittle and the smell and the heat of that and the fear and, and the adrenaline that I would feel. Everyone has a story. Stories have power and sometimes inspirational power. But think about this. Objects with stories are treasures remembered. But first, Brandon Mull. Brandon, you know, we got to ask some warm up questions for you here. Sure. Number one, do you like chocolate? I do like chocolate. Dark or milk? Dark. Okay. Sushi, yes or no? Yep. Favorite sushi place? Oh, well, I went to a place in Seattle. Yeah. There's that documentary, Hero Dreams of Sushi. Uh huh. And I went to this place in Seattle that was like one of his disciples, one of his students. And, and it was supposed to be extra good. And it kind of was, like it lived up to what it was supposed to be, yeah. <laughs> What's the funkiest thing you've eaten? Um, muktuk, which is whale blubber in Alaska. Wow, Some and? Native Alaskans gave it to me, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> it, tastes like you're, it tastes like you took a pocket knife and cut a piece off a tire and you're chewing uh -huh. on it. Uh-huh, well, okay, I've, I've had sea urchin, but yeah, okay, tastes like, like kelp. So I noticed you got a little ball there in the hand, okay. What, what's the story? Yeah, so uh, I'm a fidgeter, just like a, like a total fidgeter and, and kind of a kinetic learner, okay. or, or a kinetic thinker is sort of what I say. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I, I just like to be popping bubble wrap or <laughs> I, I almost often if you check me, I'll have a bouncy ball in my pocket or, or something, to, some, something in my hand. I'm also the kind of guy where if I walk into the movie theater with the keys in my hand, uh -huh. I'll walk out with the keys still in my hand. Like uh, I'll okay. forget to pocket them. I just like okay. having something in my hand. Okay. Well, see, then, you know, you, you have the checklist of making sure you get everything, you know, at the beginning and the end of the day. Well, it almost happens organically. Yeah. It's, it's not super deliberate. It's just a quirk. Yeah. Well, you're a quirky guy and yeah. uh, you got a kind of a quirky kind of, I guess we'd call it a job. Yeah. So, um, you know, for people that don't know, what do you do? So I write fantasy adventure novels. Yeah. Um, probably my best known series is a series called Fable Haven, which is about a brother and sister whose grandparents are the caretakers of a secret wildlife park for magical creatures. Oh, um, that's a five book series. It's got a sequel series called Dragon Watch, which the same main characters. All these adventures happening kind of as if kind of like endangered species. There's magical creatures hidden around our world on these wildlife preserves. How did you get these kind of characters? Because, I mean, was it as a kid or what, what inspired this? Uh, so the initial inspiration goes back to probably Narnia. When I was a okay. kid, I didn't like to read a thick book. <laughs> and, and when I finally read Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, it showed me that reading could be fun. Mm -hmm. um, the big imagination of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was really appealing to me and, and I started living those kind of adventures in my head and reading those kind of books and it led to this storytelling engine in my mind that just kind of kept getting stronger over the years. How in the world did you come up with the ideas? Um, the ideas are a mix of observation and daydreaming. I, I, I just kind of pay attention to the world around me and the way my head works I ask lots of what if questions. What if this happened? What if that happened? Mm -hmm. I like the supernatural. I like fantasy. And so when I daydream, I start putting giants into the <laughs> whatever I'm seeing yeah. or, or monsters or witches or, um, and that 
every now and then, a lot of the stuff I daydream about is really dumb. And like <laughs> stuff I wouldn't want to share, like it's just because it's dumb, right? Yeah. But every now and then I stumble into something that becomes like a playground in my head and that becomes what I share. What were you doing before you were doing this writing stuff? Um, I went to school, I studied PR at BYU here in Utah. Mm -hmm. And I, and I didn't really love it. I did, what I wanted to do was write novels and I was really worried that it wasn't practical, that it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. And so I trained myself to do marketing writing and okay. worked writing marketing writing. Mm -hmm. um, for about five years after school until I was able to get my first novel published. And pretty soon after that, I turned books into my day job. Oh, my God. So talking about jobs, what was your first paying job? I mean, you know, the, the one where the, you, got, you had to fill out a form. <laughs> yeah, I was a chicken stacker. Chicken stacker? Yeah, I was uh, hired by Tyson's Frozen Chickens to stack chickens when they were, had a big sale going on. Serious? <laughs> yeah, I'd go, on, I'd go on site for the day and I'd just stack chickens. And where was this? That was in Southern California. Oh, okay. So don't say train, plane, or automobile, but how in the world did you get to Utah? I, I came to Utah for school, for oh, BYU. Okay. That's yeah. what got me up here. Mm -hmm. Met a girl and stuck around. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. I gotcha. Um, family? Kids? I have four kids. Sadie, Chase, Rose, and Calvin. 16, 13, 11, 9. So what do they think about having the, a dad that writes these kind of books? My kids really like the books, and they think it's fun that I write them. Mm -hmm. um, a cool thing is I think all my kids have read all my books. My oldest especially was just rabid about Fablehaven, read all those. and um, It's a cool way that we bond because we all like the stories, and they all mm -hmm. think it's fun to write them. A lot of their friends like the books. and So, you know, it's hard to get any cool points with your kids. Yeah, no kidding. And so it's a huge relief that the kids, <laughs> you know, they think it's fun. In fact, even like if you looked up my book trailer, my most recent like kind of book advertisement online, yeah. my son and my daughter play Kendra and Seth in a video trailer. Ah. And they did a pretty good job. Yeah, there so you go. it's fun. Like they're involved in all sorts of weird ways. Okay. Or when we do launch parties, they perform with me and do stuff with me. And Was there a point in time when you said, okay, this is my new job, that I am, going, I am officially a writer? I mean, like, I think I felt like I was officially a writer when I made my first sale. Oh, okay. When I, when I sold my first professional book, I was like, oh, wow. I wanted to be a writer since high school. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, I didn't know I wanted to be a writer, but ever since I was a little kid, I was a massive daydreamer. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know I could turn that into being a writer. I didn't connect the dots until I got a little older. Yeah. But in, by, by high school, I wanted to be a writer. And then I felt like I was a writer when I was, I probably felt most like a writer when I was able to quit my day job because I was making more money writing than I was at the day job. That, that helped me feel like I was yeah. really doing it. That, that kind of sounds like the, the right mark. And that was about 15 years ago. And so like it's a, that's been a huge relief that I've been able to stay a writer because it's not guaranteed you get to stay a writer. You know? True, at least, good point. At least to stay a professional writer. Yeah. So what was your big, I mean, I don't know. Everybody talks about a big break. Was there, was there one of those for you? Yeah, I mean, the big break was the first editor that really believed in me, a guy named Chris Schobinger at Shadow Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, he saw something I wrote. He thought I had potential to, to do successful work. The, he didn't publish the first thing I wrote, but the second thing I wrote was Fablehaven, and he, he published that. So he turned you down for the first one. Yep. Got Fablehaven. And if I remember right, Fablehaven has some pretty cool little uh, awards and you know, some notoriety. Yeah, Fablehaven's done really well. We've got millions of copies sold. It's, uh, it's in like 30 languages. We, it was, uh, they're all New York Times bestsellers. Um, some, some in the series, like Dragon Watch is the sequel series, and that book two came out and was a number one New York Times bestseller. I've written, I think, 17 New York Times bestsellers now. All right, very yeah, good. Which man. is, the bestseller thing is relevant because that's how you stay employed as a writer is selling yeah. books, you know, like the royalty you get as a writer is fairly small for each individual book. So if you don't mm -hmm. sell a lot, it does, it's yeah. not your full-time job, it's a side right. job. And I'm, I'm lucky it's, it's been my full-time job for a bunch of years. Who believed in you before you believed in you? I don't think anybody did. No one believed in me before I believed in me as a writer. Okay. And so I have to go to as a person. And right. that was for sure my parents. Yeah. You know, like, 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 like my mom and dad, they really, they, they, they raised me thinking I could do what I wanted to do, you know, and, and, and that, it's funny because they raised me that way, and then but when I wanted to do writing, they were like, "Are you sure?" Because <laughs> you know I mean? they they were just trying to be good parents, and uh -huh. they knew that was like a kind of a high risk sort of thing to to chase after. And um, 
But yeah, I also got some mentoring. A, a guy who gave me early mentoring in my career, who, who believed in me before most people believed in me, or who liked my stuff early, was Orson Scott Card, the guy that wrote oh, really? Ender's Game. Oh, really? um, he, he read Fable Haven, he really liked it, and he gave me a lot of advice, a lot of mentoring. He helped me um, get my agent. He, he did all sorts of stuff that um, was above and beyond, um, just because out of the kindness of his heart and out of thinking I had some potential, I think. What's the process in writing? I mean, do you have like an outline or it's, or you just start writing and kind of go wherever? What's, what's e the deal? Every writer does a little different. We sometimes say some writers are like gardeners where it's like just plant a seed and see what grows, right? Give me mm -hmm. an idea and let's see what grows out of this idea. Um, some writers are like architects who make an extensive plan and then c execute the plan. Um, I'm somewhere in between. I make a plan in my head. You know, some writers will outline stuff out or do a lot of pre-writing. My pre-writing is daydreaming. I kind of see a movie mm -hmm. in my mind, and then I try to write that movie. Sometimes that movie in my mind will cook for years before I start it. Uh, I don't want to start it usually until I feel like I really have something, mm -hmm. um, partly because I make a contract with the publisher and promise mm -hmm. to deliver something of, of value. Right. And so I want to feel like there's something of value in my mind before I start. Hmm. How long do the, with these contracts, and I realize it depends, but how long do they give you to actually get something done? Not tons of time. You know, usually I've got under a year for each book. Mm -hmm. um, and often I'll make like a five book deal. Like I wrote a series called Five Kingdoms. Okay. And I made a five book deal to write these five books. And mm -hmm. then I had to like, my talent had to cash that check. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Like, like I, had to, I had to create something of value because they paid me pretty good money to, to write five books. And then I had to try to write five books that would make them happy. And if I failed to do that, I would not be able to get a good contract next time. You know, mm. but by by consistently delivering a quality book, um, they have faith in you, and they'll pay you a decent advance to do the next one. I, I can tell that your kids mean a lot to you. Yes. What What do you you know when when everything's said and done? You know, and we're down. You know, we're we're all gone. <laughs> yeah. What do you want your kids to remember, and, and what, what's the legacy that Brandon Mull wants to leave on this earth? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if, if you're talking about the real legacy, mm -hmm. I want my kids to know I loved them. I want the people who knew me to know I loved them. Um, and I want them to know that I, I know God's real and that he loves us and that, that we, can, we can know him. It, it takes a lot of personal effort, but we can, we can know God and get help from him. That, that sounds like it's a, it's a big part of your life. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing. Professionally, I hope that, uh, that people have fun with the books. I hope it inspires mm -hmm. people to write their own books. I hope people play games inside the story worlds I've made. I hope people share it as families. Like, mm -hmm. I see that happening, and that's professionally, that's my goal. One of my favorite inspirational quotes is from Audrey Hepburn. She said, to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. Stories have power. Sometimes they're told through music. It's time for Jessup's Beatbox. Mary and Will are gonna perform for us today. The song, it's about long distance love. You know, and that longing. Well, as Will put it, I need you. It's been four long weeks Waiting by the phone It's gonna be a hot, hot spring Waking up alone I didn't push you away I didn't make you leave No Sometimes what's best for you Not what's best for me Yes, you deserve more than me And I want you to see That I need you I need you you deserve more than me And I want you to be my girl Be my girl I'm in for a long, long ride My hand on your leg 
somewhere far, far off, where the air is clean and fresh. There's a hole in our boat, let's paddle back to shore. And now you're all wet, I want a little more. You deserve more than me And I want you to see Honey, I need you I need you Yes, you deserve more than me And I want you to be my girl Be my girl and In a distant land When I'm your man You never leave and I understand I rearrange the house Scrub the walls Spending time with our girls In between the calls It's too late for some Not too late for all So let's live, let's love Winter, spring, summer, and fall Let's live Oh, you see, you deserve more than me And I want you to see Oh, honey, I need you I need you Yes, you deserve more than me And I want you to be my girl You deserve more than me, and I want you to see. Oh, honey, I need you. I need you. Oh, I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. I'm the TV hat man. My son had this hat made for me when he lived in Russia. It's called the Ivan. Question of the day. Have you heard a dinosaur roar? Roar! <laughs> Academy Award winning composer Chance Thomas just might make you think that you have. So, Chance. Yeah, man. No disrespect to your mom and dad, but Chance, <laughs> what's the deal with the name? So, my birth father was a gambling man, and ah. he wanted me to be lucky. And so go. he named me Chance. Okay, was your dog named Lucky by chance? <laughs> no, I had a dog named Speedy and a dog named uh, Tough Stuff. My son said, you know, Dad, there's these really cool music and video games and everything, and, and I've been in radio and TV for a lot of years and love music and everything, and so he would, he would l have me listen to these music tracks and say, where do you think this came from? Where do you, well, uh, and he says, see? It's, it's, it's a video, video game. game. Okay. <laughs> and for people that don't know, this guy is like the rock star when it comes to composing music for video games. So I'm just going, okay. <laughs> so there's this one little feature, you know, that's based on these novels called Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. People might have heard of those. Yeah. I understand you have a connection. I have quite a connection, yeah. For... I think I wrote my first music based on Lord of the Rings back in 1998. I was working for a video game company called Sierra Online. Mm -hmm. um, some of you who know adventure games will know Sierra Online. Okay. And our general manager got a license to do video games based on the Lord of the Rings literature. Whoa. And so I got copies of the literature and I started studying it. I wanted to learn everything the old professor had to say about music, about sound, about songs, about instruments, and, and he goes into depth. He had a very strong musical vision for his world, and I spent about five years researching that. And when you're talking about the old man, you're talking about Tolkien. Yes, the old professor. So what is composing? Ah, so a lot of people would say, well, yeah, composing, you make up some tune to go behind a picture. That's not what we do at all. When you write music for a moving picture, whether that's a video game, a movie, a TV show, even a commercial, 
you're trying to provide an emotional narrative, right? What do I want my audience to feel as a result of what they're seeing? And really, my job as a, a person who creates music score is to manipulate human emotion. I, I remember when I was a kid, um, there was a, a composer that uh, was in my neighborhood that did a bunch of stuff for movies and TV, so admittedly that's part of the reason I wanted to talk to you here. And I remember he put headphones on, we had a group of kids, mm -hmm. and each of us, he had us listen to certain things and then said, what do you feel? Yeah, you that know? makes sense to me. And so when, you know, give me an example of, okay, for example, you've done a, a bunch of TV shows. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of some of the TV shows and how that process works. Okay, so one TV show that I've got a lot of music in is a show called Pawn Stars. <laughs> Pawn Stars, you know, it's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek show, right? Um, kind of backwater guys, you know, wheeling and dealing. And so the mood that you want to create there is a little down home, a little bit laid back, not that serious. So uh, one of the tracks I did, we had a dobro, we had some nice bouncy acoustic guitar, and that sets up that kind of vibe. Let me tell you about another one. Um, one time I was scoring uh, a video game. It was Peter Jackson's King Kong. Whoa. And there was a level that I had to score where a T-Rex comes to the jungle, bursts on the scene, screams at you, and you have to run for your life and protect Anne, Anne Darrow, you know, who is the female uh, protagonist in the movie and in the game. And I'm sitting at my keyboard, plunking away with these different sounds, trying to come up with something that would work. And I was failing miserably. So I thought, I gotta clear my head. And at the time I was in Northern California, just outside Yosemite National Park, um, my studio was on the second floor. I had a, a nice deck overlooking the Sierra National Forest. So I went out there and it was a kind of windy day. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, you know, trying to clear my head, trying to think of something. And I'm, I'm looking around and I'm looking at the trees sway and I see these two trees that happen to sway apart. And I thought, well, that's interesting. That's what would happen if a dinosaur was coming through. And so I begin to imagine what if a dinosaur was coming towards me right now? And I've got a pretty vivid imagination. And so I'm imagining this thing getting closer and closer. I'm imagining hearing the steps. <laughs> imagining what it would feel like if my house was shaking. And then I looked up and I said, what if a T-Rex stuck his head through these trees right now and roared at me? You know, and I imagined the nasty spittle and the smell and the heat of that and the fear and, and the adrenaline that I would feel. All of a sudden, and I kid you not, I started to hear music. When I had put myself in, an, and I thought about it, well, that's kind of like a, what a method actor does, right? You put yourself in the emotional state that you have to convey to your audience. And as I did that, I heard this and these, these sounds, and I ran back in and I pulled up you know, some percussion and some low brass and some trumpets and some strings. And that's when I really understood that music flows from and conveys emotion. So I've seen there's some videos of, of what you've done before, you know, and there's these orchestras and everything like that. Right. I'm dying to know, okay, so you're there. Mm -hmm. And they are, they are performing what you just created. Right. That's got to be, number one, that's got to be a cool feeling. It's very cool. Do you, do you actually play any of the instruments in that? Or do you just <laughs> no, sit no, back? No. no, no. So when I, by the time I get to the studio, I have written every part. We've gotten all the violin players have all their music with all the notation, everything they need to do. Some parts we record electronically. Like, I play the drums. And so I lay in all the percussion parts electronically prior to going to the studio. And a lot of times in the music that I compose, yes, we've got a live orchestra, yes, we've got a choir, but we also have some underlying electronic elements for color and flavor, and so all that stuff is pre-laid. Is it fair to say then that you're basically making a soundtrack for something that doesn't really exist in the world. So Absolutely. it actually opens up the creativity to do whatever the heck you feel like. Right, right. And yet what's interesting, 
is the emotion, right? The world is fantastical and bizarre and who knows what, but the emotion, if you can get the emotion right, it'll suspend people's disbelief because the emotion they're feeling is real. The game world they're playing in is total fantasy, but if I'm really feeling something, that draws them in. And, and that's why um, what people like myself do is so important. Life is never boring. Sometimes you have something I like to call the wonderful world of regret. If you've ever had a tattoo or permanent makeup that you've fallen out of love with, the folks at Tattoo Away have come up with a pretty cool system that literally removes the ink out of the skin. You've heard me say everyone has a story, and stories have power, and they definitely do. But the thing that I like to look at is objects, okay? Where do they come from? What's the story behind them? Because to me, objects with stories are treasures remembered. Imagine your great-grandfather playing his prize piano. Ashton Young says he can almost hear him and picture where the piano has been. And his brothers and sisters would actually load this piano up on horse and buggy. They'd have these big events where they would play their music. The 1913 heirloom made its way down the family line and next belonged to Young's prodigy pianist, Grandpa. You'd name the tune and he'd just play it. And even though Young never knew those relatives... My great-grandfather died in the 70s, and my grandpa died the same year I was born. Stories of their lives are music to his ears, and why he recently had the heirloom instrument restored for his family. I want my children, as they grow up, playing on the piano, that knowing that their great-grandfather learned to play the piano on this. You've heard me say, don't forget to breathe. Well, clear nasal spray washes away the bacteria and helps me breathe better. I know it'll help you breathe better, so come on. You know you want to do it. Take a deep breath and relax. Thanks for watching this episode of Jessup's Journal. It's my honor to be able to share powerful, positive, and inspirational stories right here on TV every week, as well as worldwide online at jessupsjournal.com. You heard me say it, I'll say it again. Everyone has a story. Stories do have power. They help us understand each other. With another entry into Jessup's Journal, I'm Doug Jessup. <laughs>